I tried to escape the rain in a rundown cabin. It wasn't as abandoned as I thought. So, I'm an avid hiker, and I go after this hobby whenever I can. Despite knowing it would be safer, I don't like taking people with me. I make up for it by telling my friends where I'm headed, and when to expect me to come back though. This way, if anything should happen to me, and I'm unable to call for help, there's always going to be someone who knows that I'm gone, and where to look for me. Not that I often go anywhere that's particularly dangerous. I mostly just drive out to this hilly stretch of woodland that's about an hour away from where I live. There are a lot of different signposted trails there, and even though I've taken all of them at least once before, I don't mind doing it again. When this happened, I was hiking up a longer path. All the trails go around the forest in a loop, so you'll come back out right where you started from. The one I chose involves a pretty steep ascent, so it's slightly more challenging than some of the others. It made me sweat a good deal, but since it wasn't my first time, I was doing just fine until it started raining. The weather forecast had predicted nothing but a cloudy sky and mild temperatures, so this was completely out of the blue. It was a strong kind of rain, too. Before long, the water was whipping in my face and coming down hard. I needed to get myself somewhere dry, or it'd start kneading me like dough. Of course, I hadn't brought an umbrella, so I ended up running into the woods for cover. For a while, I crouched down under a big tree, and it did shield me from the rain for a few minutes. I figured I could wait it out. But then there was this loud cracking noise behind me, and I turned just in time to watch a huge branch break off another tree and crash down below. Without me noticing, the wind had picked up and was now causing the bushes and treetops to shudder violently. I didn't want a branch like that coming down on me, so I hastily rushed back out onto the trail. With how far I'd walked already, my only option was to keep walking until I'd come back out. Pressing on was difficult. The rain was icy and made me shiver even through my jacket. Then, all of a sudden, I remembered there was an old, abandoned cabin off to the side a little way up the trail. Hopeful once more, I began to jog, shielding my eyes from the falling water with my hands as I looked around trying to locate the small wooden building. Finally, I spotted the structure in the distance and started making my way up to it. Praying that it wasn't locked, I rattled on the doorknob. The door swung open with an obedient creak, and I staggered inside before slamming it shut behind me. I dropped my backpack before peeling off my wet jacket and desperately rubbing my arms to warm them up. It was surprisingly warm inside the cabin and pleasantly dry. It smelt like old wood, but nothing I wouldn't be able to ignore. I was beyond relieved that the door had been open. Looking around, I took in my surroundings. There wasn't a lot of furniture left inside. I was standing in what must have been the living room at some point, judging from the sad-looking ragged couch that stood in the middle of it. There was a tiny open kitchen in the back, and also a staircase that probably led down to the basement, but I didn't feel like checking it out. There was a good chance the steps would break down as soon as I'd put weight onto them. Turning my attention to the windows, I found that one of them was broken, but had been pieced back together with duct tape. I tentatively gave it a poke with the tip of my finger, which it withstood. I hoped it would outlast the storm. The sound of thunder rolling came from outside, and I flinched at how loud it was. I really had been lucky to have made it to the cabin in time. I was hesitant to get comfortable on the couch for fear of the tiny life forms that might have taken up residence inside it over time, but it still beat sitting on the floor. So I sank down on the saggy cushions and took out my cell phone. Of course I had no reception whatsoever. At least I had some offline games to play while I was waiting for the storm to die down. After half an hour, I realized that wasn't going to happen anytime soon though. I would have to go easy on the battery if I wanted to have some left by the time I got out of there, so I sat aside my phone and started looking through my backpack for something else to keep myself busy with. I found a worn novel I had crammed in there and forgotten ages ago, so I started reading. I still had a bunch of snacks and water, so I ate and drank until my stomach felt pleasantly full. The wind was howling outside, and I kept hearing thunder clapping. The sky was growing darker too. I noticed that it was getting harder to read with how little light was finding its way into the windows. 
This concerned me a bit, and I wondered how long exactly I would end up stuck in the cabin. Things were looking pretty grim out there, and I wasn't too keen on spending the night in a place like this, even though it did feel kind of adventurous. I continued to read for as long as what remained of the day's light allowed me, but that was hardly another hour. The hut looked spooky in the darkness. It wasn't exactly pitch black, but enough to make me uneasy. The only thing to illuminate the living room was the occasional flash of lightning from outside. I moved over on the couch so I could watch the storm through one of the windows. Thunder rolled once again, and then, all of a sudden, a male voice cut through the silence left in its wake. Seven, six, eleven, five, nine, and twenty mile today. I jolted upright. For a second, my head had just gone completely empty. Then I glanced around frantically, before realizing that nobody had actually spoken to me. The voice was deep and eerily resonant, but it had a crackly undertone to it. It was a recording but my relief upon realizing this was short-lived. There was a strange recording playing somewhere nearby, somewhere close to me. Somebody had just turned it on. 4 11 17 32 the day before. The recording stopped. It had only been playing for mere seconds, but I could tell that it was coming from downstairs from the basement. The abrupt way it had been turned off made me think that whoever was down there had only turned it on accidentally. They'd never wanted me to know I was not alone. It was only then that I realized I was still sitting on the couch, frozen in place like a statue, staring at the basement entrance. I instantly jumped to my feet and picked up my jacket, struggling to put it on while at the same time trying to shove my belongings back into my backpack. I had to get out of there. I didn't care about the rain or the lightning or the falling branches anymore. I just needed to get out. Then I heard footsteps. They were hasty, fast, and they were moving up the stairs. Stifling a scream, I abandoned my backpack and simply burst through the door, sprinting out into the cold. Despite the darkness, I could see the trail ahead, just a small distance away from the cabin. I leapt towards it, and when I'd reached it, I just kept on running as fast as my legs would carry me. I hurriedly padded down my jacket. I could feel my cell phone, wallet, and keys in my pockets which immediately made me feel light with relief. There was also a can of pepper spray somewhere in there, which I figured was better than nothing if, God forbid, whoever had been in the cabin would catch up with me. Thankfully, it never came to that. By some miracle, I found my way back to my car. I instantly locked it upon jumping inside. I was completely drenched and utterly exhausted. It took me ages to catch my breath. I sat in the car for around half an hour, shaking and crying, before finally managing to pull myself together. Realizing I shouldn't hang around, I started driving. I was way too tired to make it all the way back home, so I just stopped at this dingy little motel that's 15 minutes away from the hiking spot and got a room there for the night. I basically collapsed on the bed. I didn't know whether or not to call the police. I've had some bad experiences with the local authorities before, so I decided not to at least not right away. It's a trust thing, I guess. What I did was I called my brother and told him everything, asking him if he and I could go back to the place together to see what was up with it. He readily accepted, and we came up with the following plan. My brother, being a huge guy himself, would come to pick me up in the morning with one or two of his friends, and we would return to the woods as a group so no one would try to mess with us. We'd go up to the cabin, retrieve my lost belongings, and take a look at it. But I also had to promise him that if we were to find evidence of something bad going on there, we'd call the cops. He showed up in his truck the following day as promised with another man with him. We headed back to the hiking spot and made our way up the trail. The storm had left its impact on the woods quite clearly. Broken branches were scattered everywhere, and some of the young, thin, and more fragile trees had been knocked over completely, basically torn out at the roots. The cabin, however, had endured. Its door was wide open when we reached it. We entered it one right after the other. I could tell the guys were just as nervous as I was. No doubt they were taking what I'd told them quite seriously. Still, we were all prepared to defend ourselves if someone was to charge at us unexpectedly. My backpack wasn't in the upstairs room, which to me could only mean that somebody had moved it. 
When my brother said we'd have to go down into the basement, I was understandably reluctant at first, but he reminded me that we had agreed on this earlier, so it was too late for me to chicken out. Each stair let out an agonized creak as we put our weight on it, and I feared the rickety old things really would end up breaking down. My brother's friend stayed upstairs so he could get us out in case that would really happen, but to my surprise, it never did. Soon enough, we found ourselves in a room that was just as big as the living room. There was enough light falling in from upstairs for us to see everything, and what we saw was not nice. First, there was the tape recorder. It sat right in the middle of the floor, like it had been propped up for us to find right away. My brother went up to it and turned it on. I flinched as I heard the same warped male voice start to speak. It sounded just as eerie as before. My brother's friend suddenly called out to us from upstairs. Is that Boots? What do you mean? I asked. That's Boots. It's this poem by Rudyard Kipling, I think. I don't know who did that reading, but it's creepy as hell. I heard it's used to simulate torture or something, like for Navy SEAL training. I don't know. By the way, it really was Boots. That's why I don't feel the need to transcribe the recording here exactly, since you can just look it up. That was the first thing to give us a really queasy feeling, though. While the room was largely empty, a single cardboard box that had been pushed up to the wall stood out. My brother took a look inside without touching it, then he waved me over. Upon bending down beside him to check it out, I found that it held several rolls of duct tape, a bunch of plastic bags, some cable binders, and a lot of small gardening tools like a little hose, secateurs, and a saw. We also found cleaning supplies in another corner of the room, right next to two buckets with plastic lids on top. The second I opened one of them, a putrid smell came wafting out, strong enough to send me and my brother reeling backwards. I cursed and immediately covered my nose and mouth, hurriedly moving in again to shut the damn thing, but in my haste, I knocked it over. We stumbled aside as viscous brown and red liquid spilled onto the floor at our feet. Feces and blood. Oh, come on, we're getting out of here, my brother yelled, grabbing me by the wrist and starting to drag me back up the stairs. That very moment, however, something caught my eye out of a darkened corner of the room. Wait. I told him, pulling my hand out of his grasp and pointing at what I had just seen. It was my backpack, hung up on a nail jutting out of the wall. How had I not noticed it sooner? I had to cautiously step over the pool of blood on the floor to reach it, but eventually I managed to grab it and then leapt back over to my brother. We ran up the stairs and left the cabin with our third companion, and as soon as we were back in the car, he called the police while I began to rummage through my backpack. Everywhere was how I'd left it. Nothing had been taken out. There was something else, though. I found it tucked between the pages of the book I'd been reading. It was this torn-off piece of paper with a brief note scrawled onto it. Just a few words, but enough to make my stomach turn. Slippery little thing. I'm not really sure why I waited so long to tell this story because this happened back in early August. I've been a lurker for a while, and reading some of these stories brought the memories of this cabin back. Keep in mind I'm no writer, so sorry if this sucks. On August 13, 16, 2014, I stayed in a cabin in Tennessee with my grandparents. It was a nice cabin, keep in mind. It wasn't exactly as clean as it was in the picture, but it was nice. As you can see in the picture, there is the upstairs, and from up there at the pool table you can look over the banister and see the downstairs. My grandparents slept in the downstairs bedroom, and while I tried to sleep on the couch downstairs I could only ever get an hour or two of sleep before I went upstairs to sleep in the bed with my sister. I have difficulty explaining this part, so I hope you can see from the pictures on the website. But right as you walk up the stairs and you get to the top there is a dresser. I'm sure these pictures are probably from years back because like I said the cabin looked much cleaner in the pictures. The floor in front of the dresser was stained a dark brown color, and as I've learned from horror movies and stories, it was probably blood. I wish I had a picture, but it was on my old cell phone that got broken. 
When you're downstairs, you can't see the bed because right behind the dresser is a short wall doesn't go all the way across the room and behind the wall is the bed. I can't remember which night it was, but one night as I got in the bed with my sister, right before I fell asleep, it felt as though something punched me. That's the only way I can think to explain it. It wasn't painful though, and it didn't hit my face. It's hard to explain, but it basically felt like some air knocked my head back. I was laying in the bed facing the wall behind the dresser, and it was the strangest thing. It knocked my face back as if something punched me, but like I said it wasn't painful. My sister also asked me if I had heard footsteps on the stairs, which I had. I thought they were just my grandma or grandpa coming to check on us, because we're still only teenagers and my grandma loves to worry, but they had said they didn't go up the stairs at all those nights. And it's strange to think that I didn't feel threaded at all there. I know this pales in comparison to most stories on here, but looking back I can't believe I wasn't as terrified there as I am thinking about it. I'm guessing this is the subreddit to put it on, I hope it is. And I honestly plan on going back there someday, just to see if anything else happens. I wish I had some pictures from my stay there, but I hope the ones from the website are good enough to at least show what it looked like. Sorry if there are any mistakes by the way. I'm typing on my phone. This is my first post and am not sure if the is the right place for it. But I wanted to share my horrifying experience from high school. High school was four of the greatest years in my life. Things were so much simpler back then than they currently are. Now I am 25 years old with six years of service in the Navy, and looking back those times seem so long ago. I always reminisce on all the good times I had with my friends. We were a close group, always getting together after school or going out on the weekends. My head swells with so many fond memories I have had with them, so many great memories. Except one. One memory that, when I think back to it, still sends a chill down my spine. It was our senior year, 2008, and graduation was just around the corner. We were all excited to be moving ahead with our lives. I was joining the military and the rest were going to different colleges. I will admit it was a bittersweet moment. Yes, we were excited for the future, but a bit sad knowing our group would not be whole like it was throughout high school. My friends decided they were going to give me an awesome going away celebration. The plan was to pitch in some money and have my older brother rent us a cabin in the mountain for the weekend. We packed our bags and drove up the mountain to the cabin. There was a small town nearby and our cabin was about half a mile down the road. There were a few other cabins nearby but ours was at the edge of town surrounded by woods. We unpack our things and head inside. We were not disappointed. The living and dining room was enormous with a big L-shaped couch and a long table with plenty of chairs. We had a good-sized television and even a pool table. There were three separate bedrooms down the hall with two beds each. There were seven of us, so I volunteered to sleep on the couch. I didn't really care it was comfy as hell anyways. The only problem I had was that the couch was next to this sliding glass door that for some reason had no blinds or drapes. I was not about to admit to everyone that it bothered me. As soon as we were unpacked, we decided to get the good time started. My brother and a couple others went into town to buy alcohol and food, while the rest of us prepared for the night's festivities. We ate, we drank, played some drinking games like beer pong, which I was never good at, and had a good time. Later that evening, we were all gathered in the living room talking about funny moments we had had in high school. We were all feeling pretty good from all the alcohol consumption. As I was telling one of my stories, we heard a female friend of mine shriek, Oh my God. It startled the shit out of us, and we quickly turned our heads to her, standing in front of the sliding glass door. She quickly turns around with the biggest smile and says, You guys, it's snowing. We all run to the window like children, and sure enough, there is a good amount of snow falling from the sky. We go outside, and as the snow builds up, we have a good snowball fight and build ourselves a crappy snowman. After a while, we get tired and go inside. Running around in our lack of sobriety caused a couple of my friends to puke. It was late and we all decided to turn in for the night. 
We had planned to buy a sled in town and find a snowy hill in the morning. We all went to our rooms and fell asleep. I was awoken in the middle of the night to what I thought was a stick or branch cracking in the distance. I laid there for a few minutes trying to see if I heard it again or if it was just my imagination. Nothing. I told myself I was hearing things. I got up to drink a bottle of water. I did not want to wake up the next morning with a nasty hangover. As I walked by the sliding glass door I looked outside. Snow was still falling, just not as much, and the moon gave the snow an eerie blue glow. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge. As I drank, I got lost in my thoughts. I was going to miss times like these with my friends. Did I make the right decision joining the military? I was contemplating my future when I was suddenly snapped back into reality by the sound of crunching. I listened, trying to figure out what exactly that sound was. It slowly got louder, then stopped. Then it slapped me in the face. Footsteps. Footsteps in the snow. I immediately turned my head to the sliding glass window. My heart skipped a beat. A shock of pins and needles ran down my skin. There at the sliding glass window was a dark silhouette of a man. His right hand was cupped around his eyes, and he was peering in, surveying the living room. I was frozen, confused wondering who this was looking in. He must not have seen me for he was still moving his head looking around. It was only when he lifted his left hand and cupped it around the other side of his face that my confusion turned to horror. In his left hand he held a hatchet. I just stood there and watched as he looked inside. He put his hands down and looked down to his right towards the door handle and began reaching for it. That's when I noticed it and my heart stopped. In our drunken stupidity, we forgot to lock the door when we came back inside from playing in the snow. I panicked when his hand gripped the door handle. See, can I help you? I said loudly trying to sound intimidating, but clearly sounding scared. It startled the man, for he quickly looked up in my direction. We stared at each other for what seemed like hours, but were merely seconds. I could not see his face, but I could feel his eyes piercing my soul. He let go, slowly backed away, and started jogging away. He didn't break eye contact with me until he was a good fifteen feet from the cabin. One of my friends who woke up to my shouting came to the living room and asked who I was talking to and why I was standing in the dark. I locked the door in a hurry, and he could tell there was something wrong. He looked out the glass door and caught a glimpse of the man, a second before he disappeared into the woods. What the hell is that? I woke everyone up and told them what happened. We were all shitting bricks. Needless to say, we all decided to nope the F out of there the next morning, and none of us were going to sleep the rest of the night. As we left the next morning, hundreds of thoughts ran through my head. What if I didn't sleep in the living room? If there was nobody there with the door left unlocked, what could have happened? What were his intentions with that hatchet? We'll never know and it's sad to say that my last memory together with my friends was a horrible one. This was one of the most creepy and traumatizing things that has ever happened to me. I was staying with my family mom, dad, grandma, grandpa and in a frame and chalet styled cabin in northern Washington. Washington has a lot of forests and densely wooded areas. This cabin was also on a lake, and we brought our small lake boat with us. This trip was mostly so we could try out our new boat. Everything was going well, we were having fun on the lake, hanging out with family, and just generally having a good vacation. My family decided to go to a convenience store and leave me alone in the cabin. This happened a while ago, but I was old enough to stay home alone. The nearest convenience store was about 30-45 minutes down a dirt road. As you may have expected, this is where it started to go wrong. They leave. I volunteered to stay home because I am relaxing and don't want to have to get in a car. About 15 minutes after they leave it started to get dark. I am walking around listening to music and enjoying the sunset perfectly framed over the lake. Chalets generally have pretty large windows and this specific cabin did not have curtains. This made watching the sunset pretty enjoyable but did not help once the sun fully set. Washington is known for its forests and is also known for Bigfoot. 
This story is not related to Bigfoot as it is just a legend. I am just pointing that out for reference. So at this point I am messing around and exploring the cabin more because the sun has now set and there isn't really much besides dark, kind of creepy forest and the lake outside of the window. As I am messing around something catches my eye. I swore I could have saw very slight movement down by the small boat dock, about 125 meters down a small windy path and hill. I didn't really think much of it as I was in the forest and there are many animals that could have been moving around. Deer, moose, etc. At this point I have forgotten about the movement I saw and head to the bathroom, which is down a hallway away from the window. While I was in the bathroom, I just got this terrible feeling like something was wrong. I wanted to go check to see if there was anything inside the cabin or anything outside. I couldn't do this however because I was, well, using the bathroom. The longer I stayed in the bathroom, the worse the feeling got. Every drop of rain landing on the roof felt like the tick of a clock counting down to the end of the world. I quickly finished up in the restroom and practically sprinted down the hall. I looked out the large set of windows and saw nothing but the lifeless forest and the moonlight reflecting off of the lake. I then start to feel that stereotypical feeling of being watched, generally, nothing even is watching you. Or so you think. This time, there was something watching me. I turned around and looked down the hall at the other clear glass door at the end of the hallway. Standing on the other side of that door is a freaking deer standing on two legs. My mind instantly screams, Skinwalker. I try not to acknowledge it. I close my eyes and sprint back to the bathroom, locking myself in the bathroom as it is the only room without windows. I sit there in silence, barely breathing for what felt like 12 years. My family finally got back and I came out of the bathroom. Nothing was there and after checking the next morning, there were no signs anything ever had been there. You can choose whether to believe me or not. You can choose whether to believe that it was all in my head. But even if it was all in my head, it still truly was a scary experience. So I used to work at a pretty remote camping spot with some cabins for people to rent. This story happened about five years ago, but is still pretty freaky when I think of it. I'm a small five foot six woman and on this night, the only other person working with me was Max, an even smaller woman with anger issues these matters, so we were sticking together all through the night. Around 11 we get a call from one of the rented cabins complaining of loud knocking. We get our flashlights and make our way to the cabin that called Cabin 4 and meet with the renters. They tell us they heard some loud knocking coming from outside, like someone was running along the outside knocking their fist along the wall. We go check it out and find nothing, so we report back to them to tell them it was probably pine cones falling or something. They say okay, and we leave them to try and get some sleep. Me and Max hang out at the main cabin talking about our plans for the weekend, until we hear a knocking sound outside. Max goes outside to check it out, only to find nothing. As soon as she came back inside and sat back down, it started again. She gets ticked and yells at them to stop assuming it was the couple pranking us. It stops for a bit before starting up again and stopping when she yells. The third time it starts she gets on the phone and goes off at the couple, only for them to say that they were at their cabin and were also hearing the knocking. Now we're all freaked out so the couple comes up to the main cabin and we all wait for it to start again. It does and Max storms outside with one of the men behind her and yells that she's calling the cops a bluff we could only call the other cabins from our phone, and our phones didn't work. Throughout the night this pattern would repeat, the knocking and Max yelling. Eventually the sun came up, and we all went outside and found footprints all around the cabin. We didn't personally check the couple's cabin, but they left real quick and said there also were footprints there. We told our boss who said he would look into it a lie he did nothing and said we were being dramatic. Both me and Max continued working there for a couple months, both of us carrying Mace and Max with a knife, but eventually I left for college and Max quit soon after. We still talk and often bring this story up at parties, only to scare and confuse people.
I don't have much time. My name is Nova Vale. I moved into a cabin not too long ago. The area is rural and rough, with trees as far as the eye can see. My nearest neighbor is probably an hour away. It's after me, and I will never escape it. This is not what I wanted to happen. On my first day here, I unpacked and settled in. The living room was dusty, and there were some leaves on the ground. I swept the living room and cleaned up spiderwebs that had gathered in the windows. There's a fireplace on the left wall of the cabin. It's strange, there's this eerie painting of a woman above it. She has black hair, her skin is pale, and her eyes are so black. It's as if her iris and pupil were the same color. Whatever. The old owners must have left it here. I'll call them soon to see if they can take it. I'm planning on putting my TV there. I cleaned up the fireplace and unpacked all my things. My couch, coffee table, and everything else. As I was walking up the stairs, I heard footsteps. There should be nobody else here. Whatever, I'm probably just hearing things. I walked left into the hall and finally reached my bedroom. I hauled the boxes that contained my bed and bedroom furniture up the stairs and assembled everything. Gosh, I'm tired. I'm going to get some sleep. As I fell asleep, I swear, for a split second, I saw someone in the doorway. On my second day here, I woke up in the early hours. I heard loud bangs and knocks downstairs. I checked the clock, it was 427. Who the hell is knocking at this hour? I'll just ignore it. I'm tired and I have a lot of work to do. I fell back asleep. I woke up around 1020 and walked downstairs to cook myself breakfast on the dirty stove. Ugh, I seriously need to clean this thing. I walked to where the dining table was supposed to be and realized, oh my gosh, I forgot to assemble it. Whatever. I walked to the couch and sat down. Wait. What the hell? Right in front of me was some ash on the ground. I cleaned up the fireplace, I never lit it back up. I probably stepped in some ash and didn't even realize it. Right. Knock. 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 My eyes darted straight to the door. Now what? Knock. 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 I walked to the door, and as I was about to open it, my stomach immediately sank. It's not possible. I haven't changed my mailing addresses or anything, but oh my gosh, what am I doing? It felt as if my body had a mind of its own. I opened the door. It was a woman. She was pale and had black eyes, almost as if her iris and pupil were the same color. She seemed familiar. Ah, uh, hello, I uttered. Something about this wasn't right. The woman didn't say a thing. Ma'am, are you lost? Is everything okay? Do I need to call for help? I asked her. She began to develop a slight smirk on her face, which made me slightly shudder. The woman raised her hand and pointed behind her without looking. She pointed at a tree. Weird. She then put her hands down. Don't answer the door, she said in a raspy voice. Is this woman okay? She had red marks on her neck, and she looked so thin. She walked away, and I shut the door, locking it behind me. I locked all the windows in the house, both downstairs and upstairs. I pulled up the curtains and closed them. I knew what this was. I grabbed water and food. I couldn't let anyone else know I was here. I grabbed anything necessary, halted upstairs, and entered my room. I was shaking with fear. I closed and locked the door behind me. I could stay in here as long as I needed. I would be safe here, I thought. On my third day here, the peace was broken. That woman, she seemed so familiar, like the woman in the painting. Oh my gosh, the footprints those had to be hers, right? I haven't been able to sleep. I don't know for sure if something's wrong. No, I do know. Nothing feels right. I haven't left my room since yesterday's events took place. I'm too terrified. I won't speak and I won't move. As I'm writing this, I don't think I have much time left. I'm shaking and trembling. That woman... That woman. That woman. Ever since I saw her and looked into her lifeless eyes, I have this nauseous feeling. I feel sick. I feel horrible. I cannot explain it. I'm going to call the man who sold me this cabin. No wonder it was so cheap. There's something wrong, and I know it. I dialed his number. Ring, ring, ring. Hello, this is Jerry Frederick. Who am I speaking to? 
A voice said on the other end of the line. Ah, uh, hi, it's Nova. You sold a cabin to me, I said quietly. Ah, yes. Hello, is there something wrong, he asked. Yeah, actually there is. Before I tell you that, is there any bad history to these woods? I wouldn't want to, uh, live in dangerous woods, you know, I replied. Well, I'm sorry I didn't tell you this before. I just needed to get rid of the cabin. Fast. You see, the woods there were owned by many women and men, but something otherworldly happened and the women began dying rapidly acts of unaliving themselves and murders. It's a tragedy, really. A lot of the women's spirits never found rest, so now people say they torment anyone who trespasses on their land. My wife, Mary, was a victim of the otherworldly massacre. I couldn't stand the thought of her spirit never finding peace, so I just left. Honestly, I wish I had never done that. I'm sorry, Nova. I don't think I will be returning. She won't be at peace until she can take another soul with her. It won't be me. I truly am sorry, Miss Vale. He explained. Beep, beep, beep. He hung up. He hung up on me. I can't let her get to me. I shouldn't have moved here. I'm leaving. It's my third day, I know, but I am leaving. It's my fourth day here. I couldn't sleep at all. I shouldn't have talked to that woman. I'm hearing scratches at my window and loud banging. I know she will find a way in soon, and when she does, she will take me with her. Bang, bang, bang. I know it's her banging at the door. I know she wants her rest, and I know she will do anything to get it. Pit, pat, pit, pat. I know she has gotten inside, and I know she will find me soon. I hear her walking up the stairs. My time has come. She will be here soon enough. I should have never moved here, and I should have never answered the door. Creak, creak, creak. It's 4.25 am. She will find me soon enough. I'm trembling and shaking while I'm writing this. My door is locked, but I know. I know she will find a way in. It's 4.26 a.m. Pit, pat, pit, pat. She has stopped outside my door. I'm trying to be as quiet as I can be. There is no difference because I know. I know she will find me. It's 4.27 a.m. Bang, bang, bang. Rattle, rattle, rattle. The door creaks open slowly. The figure of a thin-looking woman stands in the doorway. In July 2015, I was on a hike with my husband and two friends. We also had our dog with us. We live in western Washington, and that time of year it stays lightish until 9 to 10 p.m. It was about 7.30 p.m. as we headed up. The trail peaks at a beautiful lake with a loop trail that brings you back to the original trail, I order to descend. Light or not, it was late enough evening that many people passed us on their way down as we headed up. You can see the entirety of the lake from the top of the trail, and we were clearly the last people up there. As we made our way back down, it was starting to get dark. Strangely, we crossed paths with a man making his way up towards the lake. He was not dressed in a way that would suggest he was camping or even hiking. He had regular sneakers, a t-shirt, and shorts. No water, no pack, nothing. We tried to make conversation but he would not speak or make eye contact. My dog whined and whined and sniffed his feet and wanted to run back to him. I had to call her off several times. The whole interaction seemed so odd. We could not shake the feeling that he was incredibly out of place. About 25 minutes later, we heard a single gunshot. He had killed himself. At the parking lot to the trail, there was one remaining car. We assumed it must have been his. It was unlocked, and there was an envelope on the driver's seat both observed through the window, didn't open the door. We notified the ranger that stayed in a cabin at the edge of the parking lot, who said he'd call the police, but he wasn't risking running into a cougar to go up and check on the guy. He's not the first and won't be the last, were his exact words. I wish I would have thought to ask, are you okay, or anything at all? I went to a typical YMCA summer camp when I was in middle school. It was a two-week session every summer, and it was exhaustingly fun. 
We'd stay up all night telling stories or daring each other to do stuff. One night, we planned a pillow raid on a girl's cabin, where we would sneak through the woods with pillows and creep into their cabin for a pillow fight. This was to retaliate for the same girls throwing our clotheslines into a tree. We snuck over to their cabin and walloped everyone with pillows. Counselors began yelling and shining lights as we all ran off. I lost the group, but my friend Brad and I stayed in pursuit of someone who went in a different direction. We assumed they knew a shortcut or secret way back. They ended up diving into a bush somewhere off the path in the woods between the boys' and girls' cabins, and Brad and I followed quietly. We squatted down in the bush next to an individual who was not part of our cabin and wasn't involved in the pillow fight either. Confused about whether we should stay quiet or run, I screamed and grabbed Brad to run with me. I remember seeing this individual's eyes as they raised a finger to try to shush us, but we bolted. When we got back to the cabin, we tried to recount what happened. It became clear that the person in the woods was a creep who was coincidentally watching the girl's cabin. This has happened several times by now. It started about 16 months ago when I was cleaning my house around 12 a.m. My husband boyfriend at the time worked nights, so I had adjusted to his schedule. I usually kept the blinds open during the day and would close them at night while tidying up before bed. Our room was my last stop on the first night this happened. The curtains and blinds were open as I was sweeping the floor when I felt the sensation of being watched. I looked around and then noticed a silver sedan parked outside my house, mostly on the grass in my front lawn. For context, my bedroom window is about 15 yards from the road in front of my house. It's a small front yard in a pretty densely populated neighborhood. Anyway, I saw the car before I saw the person, I'm not sure if it was a man or a woman, but there was clearly someone sitting in the driver's seat of the car, and another person was standing about five yards from my window, staring at me. The only reason I could see this was because the moon was fairly bright that night. I shrieked, dropped to the floor, and crawled to the light switch to turn it off so I couldn't be seen. I called my husband to ask what I should do, and he told me to call the cops to up. I did, but of course, by the time they got there, the car was gone. They asked if they could see my security footage, and I agreed, but the footage from that time period was just gone. It skipped over the few minutes they would have been outside. This has happened several times since then, and I've completely given up on calling the police, as I feel like they think I'm crazy. I have no proof that this is happening, but I would like to hear some opinions on what they might be doing. In the past 16 months, it's happened probably 10 times. Sometimes the person is standing in the yard, and sometimes they aren't. Also, the car has been different every single time, but the light inside the vehicle is always on. However, when I try to look, the people inside are never positioned where I can see their faces. I'll run to grab my phone to call someone anyone, but they are always gone by the time I return. When I was a kid, I used to dream every night, but as I got older, my dreams slowly faded with time. There was one dream I continuously had for an extended period of time, and it never fully evolved past a certain point, until one night. It would always start with me being in a cabin, a warm, cozy cabin in a huge pine forest. I remember laying in a bed on a cozy summer evening, looking at the cream-colored curtains that would sway in the breeze of the open window. Every time something would make me get up and go outside to the vast forest, the giant pine trees reaching for the amber-colored sky as dusk was settling in. The dream would always start off as this, but in the beginning I would wake up before much else happened. The dream would slowly progress to me walking around this cabin, until one day I saw a red note on the ground. It was no larger than a regular business card you'd see in your regular store. As the dream progressed with time, the warm glow of the sky would get darker and darker, and eventually turned into a moonlit sky with no clouds, but every time I would find an oddly placed red note on the ground, placed on the ground in front of a large parting in the vast trees, in what looked like an endless road into nothingness. 
Slowly the dreams would feel closer to nightmares, as every time I would find this note, I would begin to hear faint screams in the distance, what almost sounded like foxes yowling, but to me it always sounded more humanoid. The last time I remember this dream, it started from the very beginning, the sway of the curtains and the breeze, but it was now pitch black outside, no more comfort from the warm amber glow of the sky like previously. Something in me still stepped outside of the cabin, and there it was, the red note, like all the other times. There was never anything on the small slip of paper, it was a deep crimson red. Something was different this time. As I picked up the slip of paper, my whole body froze. I would hear what sounded like a woman wailing in the distance, blood-curdling screams of someone or something down that parting in the trees. This time I couldn't see what was up ahead. The moonlit sky was overcast, it was darker than ever before. The last thing I remember is the croaking of a woman as if her neck had been snapped. The blood gurgling in her throat was now directly in front of me, I couldn't see her. I was jolted awake from the dream when a hand came out of the darkness, reaching for my face. To this day I haven't had that same dream, and it's been close to twenty years. As I got older, I began to realize the vague parts of the cabin I remember was that of my grandmother's house. Her sister fell out of a large pine tree on the property and snapped her neck on impact before my mother was born. Probably six, seven years ago, I bought a phone from a guy on Craigslist and used it for a good solid month or two. I rooted it, modded it, got bored with it, and decided to sell it. One of the very first people to respond to the ad I had up was the cousin of the guy I bought it from. I found this out after the fact. Anyways, the guy offered me the asking price, and then he started offering me more money, ensuring he would secure the phone. It was a little weird, but I wasn't going to turn down money if he was going to give it to me. So we met up to complete this sale, and he started checking over the phone. I could tell something wasn't right, so I asked for my phone back and tried to take it out of his hand. He resisted, punched me in the face, and took off running. I never got my phone back because I can't run for shit. Turns out, the guy I met up with was going around meeting people to buy their phones and then robbing them. It all finally ended when he held up a couple with a young kid in the back seat at gunpoint for all of their belongings. They drove up to a store a block or so away from where it all happened and called the cops. The main guy and an accomplice were picked up a little later and admitted to the whole thing, plus other robberies. He ended up doing three five years or some shit like that, and I got some money back for the lost property. I am a 20-year-old woman and my husband and I live in Richmond, Virginia, which is where this story takes place. I don't mind revealing where we live as it is important to my story's moral. About two weeks ago, we decided that we wanted to get season passes to King's Dominion, which is the biggest amusement park in our state. We were a little short on cash to get the passes and were in between paychecks, so we decided to sell some of our old things on an app called Let Go which is basically like Craigslist where you can post items you have for sale and it shows it to everyone within a 50 mile radius of your location. The only way let go it is different from Craigslist is that you have to make an account on let go, which can be made with your email account or by syncing it to your Facebook. No personal information is given out besides your name, your general area, and a tiny thumbnail or whatever your profile picture is on Facebook. You are also able to chat with other buyers and sellers through a messaging system on the app to keep your phone numbers anonymous. Anyways, I had posted my old tablet on let go to make up for the money we still needed to get the passes, and within a few minutes I got a message from a woman named Keisha who was interested in buying my tablet. One thing I noticed about Keisha's account is that it didn't have a thumbnail picture. I brushed it off thinking that she just didn't sync it with her Facebook. This was red flag number one. The conversation with Keisha went as follows. Keisha, hi, is the tablet still available? Me, yes, it is. Keisha, great, can I pick it up in two hours when I get off? Me, actually my husband and I are trying to get KD passes today so we can go this evening. I could drop it off to you now if that's okay. 
Keisha. Yeah, that works. I work at the McDonald's off Nine Mile Road. Me, okay, great. Can you send me the address so I can head over? Keisha, sure. Now, the conversation stopped there for a bit after I had asked Keisha for the address to her McDonald's, since that area has quite a few of them. She didn't respond for a while, which now looking back after everything that happened, should have been a red flag number two. But at the time, I figured she was slow to reply because she told me that she was at work. My husband was with me, so I asked him if he knew which one it was, and he looked up on Google where McDonald's were on Nine Mile Road, and there actually was only one store on that road. I copied the address from Google and messaged her back ten minutes after hearing nothing new from her asking if this was the right address. Me, hey is it the one at blah 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 Nine Mile Road? Keisha, yeah that's it me. Okay, I will be there in about 20 minutes, Keisha. Okay, message me when you are here so I can tell my manager I need to run out to my car so I can meet you. Me, alright, see you soon. After that, my husband and I jumped in his truck and drove to the McDonald's that she worked at. We had to take the highway, and it was rush hour by the time we got on the highway. So what was supposed to be a 20-minute drive turned out to be a 40-minute drive. The whole time we were driving there, Keisha would send me messages saying, Where are you? She did this about four or five times, and each time I would tell her something along the lines of, Sorry, traffic is brutal only a few minutes away. We finally got to the McDonald's and parked in the parking lot right in front of the main entrance. My husband suggested that we sit on the bed of his truck, because he didn't want to sketch Keisha out by making her walk up to the window of a stranger's car. I agreed, and we hopped out of his truck, and he pulled down the little hitch door to his bed, and we sat on it. I then pulled out my phone and messaged Keisha, saying, Hey, I'm here. She replied very quickly with, Okay, what car are you? I told her I was in the big orange truck. We waited for about five minutes staring at the door waiting for her to come out, and no females walked out of the restaurant. The only person who did walk out was a tall, skinny man on a cell phone who got picked up in a black car that had pulled up next to ours. At this point, my husband and I were tired of waiting, so I went back on let go to see if she had messaged me something new. I looked up our conversation, and at the top of our messages was a banner that read, This user has blocked you. I showed my husband this, and because we listened to so many horror stories on YouTube, we both got creeped out and my husband got very angry. He told me to wait in the truck with the doors locked while he went inside the McDonald's and asked the manager if anybody named Keisha worked there, taking my phone with him to show evidence of our conversation. So I did just that, and waited in the truck with my finger glued to the lock button. A few minutes later, he comes back to the truck with a concerned look on his face. He told me that the manager said that there was a girl named Keisha that worked there but she spelled her name Keisha instead of Keisha, and she had been sent home at 11 this morning because of business decline. It was in that moment that I put two and two together. The only person we saw come out of the restaurant was a man on a phone, who quickly got into a car parked next to ours. I never told Keisha that I was coming with my husband. For all that they knew, I was just coming by myself a good 15 miles away from where I lived in the bad part of town. I was terrified. We peeled it out of the parking lot and raced back home. On the way back, I deleted my let go app. Now, I know this sounds like a lot of speculation, but I am almost certain that this I was almost the victim of abduction because there have been several cases of women in Richmond, other areas of Virginia, who have used let go and other resell apps like it and have gone missing, been robbed at gunpoint, or been taken in by human traffickers. This story isn't really as scary as it could have been, and I am very grateful for how lucky I was. I'm forever thankful that my husband came along with me, because if he didn't, there's a good chance I wouldn't be typing this story tonight. But I really wanted to tell my story as a way to spread awareness that there are some very evil people out there, in everyone's cities, and even in your neighborhoods. They will use every method of communication to find their next victims, even resell websites and apps to lure someone in and do unspeakable things to them. Abductions resulting in human trafficking cases are at a national all-time high and are only getting worse. Please be careful of who you talk to online. 
If you do sell something on one of these apps, on Craigslist, or any other resale site where you have to meet the other person in person, always meet in a public place at a popular time of day. Bring somebody with you. Never let them come to your house or you theirs. It's crazy to think about how cautious we have to be nowadays, and I hope all these evils and crimes go away soon. But until then, please be safe and be smart. I've been looking to sell my car before the summer is over, so I took to Facebook and Craigslist to find potential buyers in the area who were willing to take it off my hands. I posted my ad on Facebook Marketplace, which is essentially Craigslist for Facebook where you can buy and sell products around your approximate location. I figured it would be the perfect place to find someone near me who was in the market for an old fixer upper my piece of junk, that is. I should add at this point that I'm a 22 year old woman, and on Marketplace obviously you post from your Facebook account, so whoever sees my posts can go to my profile to message me. Unfortunately, unlike Craigslist, people knew exactly who I was before they were buying. I had several people interested, so I answered them in order, and the first person just so happened to be an older woman. From her page, she looked harmless, so I thought it would be no problem. I was busy for a few days so I told her I'd get back to her soon, and she said okay. Her last message to me said, that's fine, let me know Thursday, Bill. A little weird, but I thought maybe her husband was messaging me for her from her account, or maybe it was even a typo, who knows, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. On Thursday, I got a random message from another account, a man who will call Bill. He messaged me the exact same message as she did the day before, which was something along the lines of interested, when can I come see it? I put two and two together and realized that the woman signed Bill on her last message the day before, and I figured it was her husband now contacting me from his own account. I asked if he was the one who messaged me from her account the day before, and he confirmed, saying that she was his wife who had passed away back in March. Strange. But everyone has their own way of coping. At this point, I felt bad for the guy, and there weren't really any alarm bells going off, other than that it was slightly weird he was contacting me from his dead wife's Facebook. It was also weird that his Facebook didn't have any photos of himself, just his backyard as his profile picture and cover photo. I chalked it up to him being older and not caring about social media. He ended up saying he'd like to see the car, and we scheduled a day for him to come look at it. Unfortunately, I had to give him my house address because the car's brakes are not in working order and the car isn't insured, so I couldn't take it on the road to somewhere nearby to meet up. Regardless, I was still not too worried because my boyfriend and his mother were at the house I lived with them in the summertime, so I thought if push came to shove, there would be someone there to mediate. He was supposed to come at 3.30, but 3.30 came and went without him showing up. He said he lived in a town about a half hour away, so we waited a little while after to see if maybe he would come late. I was pissed for a while, because he'd just wasted my time confirming he wanted to see my car and possibly buy it, and he stood me up without any explanation. Around 4, I gave up and started playing some games on my laptop. My boyfriend, bless his soul, still kept watch over the driveway to see if Bill would come out after all. Suddenly, he had urgency in his voice. Alyssa, I think that's him. I got up and ran to the window just in time to see a small car with an unknown driver and a young man in the front seat pull away from the front of our driveway. Apparently, the car pulled in front of the house and sat there for several seconds before driving away, and I just caught the tail end of it. I live on a quiet side street of a pretty safe suburban neighborhood, so it most likely wasn't some random stranger who just so happened to be passing by. They were definitely in front of the house, waiting for a minute. My boyfriend looked disturbed and kept repeating that he was sure it was them, and that they got cold feet. We all thought it was weird that they would drive a half hour only to leave. My boyfriend's mother said she thought it was because they thought they could get me, a vulnerable young woman, alone, and that they'd sped away once they saw that there were several cars in the driveway. One of the cars was the one I was selling, too, and it looked exactly like in the photos I posted on Marketplace, so I was sure the car wasn't the issue. The most disturbing thing to me was the fact that there were two people in the car, 
and at least one of them looked like he was capable of doing something, should I have been alone. Thank God in hindsight that there were several people home, or the situation definitely could have escalated. I really, really wish I hadn't given them my address, and I can only hope that those people don't ever come back. This was back in 2012, but it still gives me the heebie-jeebies when I think about it. I had just gotten out of a bad relationship and was living with my grandparents, hunting for apartments and I found a house that was only a few blocks from the group home I work at. I thought, great, even in the snowy weather I'd be able to walk to work. I called the number on the Craigslist ad and set a time to check it out. I boogie on over and am greeted by a man in his mid-thirties. He seemed very awkward at first, but showed me around and said if things worked out I could take my pick of either of the available bedrooms. He started making small talk and was becoming increasingly weird. He was asking me questions about how old I was, if I smoked pot, if I was single. Not totally red flags, but the way he came off was weird nonetheless. I say I have to go and he gives me the email of the homeowners, turns out it was his girlfriend's parents' place. So I dawdle on home and email the couple giving my references and income info as one does. A couple days later the husband calls me and says hastily that the rooms are no longer available. I'm a little miffed, but what can I do about it, right? Cut to a week later my friend and I are hanging out, smoking pot and just shooting the shit. I can't remember how it came up, but she mentioned that there's a website where you can see all the registered sex offenders. Of course our curiosity takes over and we look it up. I think you know where this is going. We scroll and scroll and eventually apartment man. My jaw drops and I can't believe what I'm seeing. His charge? Incest with a minor. I don't know if anything would have happened, but I'm glad the homeowners turned me down. And what dumb luck that I stumbled across the website a week after. not really a horror story, but just so unusual and weird. I was selling a car on Craigslist and finally got a solid nibble. A woman wanted to buy it for her teenage daughter, so I offered to drive it over so she could look at it and take it out for a test drive. I show up and knock on the door. The mother is happy I'm there and she invites me in, asks if she can take it out for a test drive, drops about 4k in my hand and takes off with her daughter leaving me standing in the living room with the cash and a friendly white dog. I awkwardly sit down and about ten minutes later the husband comes up and he acts like it's perfectly normal for me to be there and we chat a bit. The mother and daughter come home, agree to buy the car, I sign the title over, make arrangements for a friend to come and get me. I didn't think they would buy it and chit chatted with this couple for about twenty minutes until my friend came and rescued me. This happened just over a week ago. Ordered a liquid lipstick and didn't like the color, so resold it at below market price. Guy comes to pick it up, it's some high school aged kid from the hood. Assumed he was getting it for his girlfriend and figured he could save himself five dollar and shipping getting a slightly used one and she wouldn't know the difference. Met him in ratty sweats with no makeup and wet hair. Thought nothing of it. That night at 3 a.m. I got a text from him saying, Baby, you looked so beautiful today, and asking how I'd like to make some quick money. I didn't answer, thought maybe he was drunk and texted the wrong number, went back to sleep. The next day he called, I didn't answer and blocked the number. He texted me from another number, I responded, no thanks, and blocked the number. Five minutes later, he called again from yet another number. Didn't answer, he left a voicemail asking once again if I wanted to make quick money and informing me that if so, all I had to do was Venmo him $200 right away. I blocked the number. Five minutes later, I got six texts from yet another number. Blocked it. Quiet for a few hours, then came back at me on another number. This went on for about four days. Back in the early 2000s, when I was fresh out of college, I landed a job at a nondescript office building with a handful of cubicles and a water cooler that never seemed to run out of gossip. I drove a big, old 80s car with an enormous trunk, the kind of vehicle that had seen better days, 
but still had a certain vintage charm. Little did I know that car would become a bizarre chapter in my life. One day, my supervisor approached me with an unusual request. It wasn't Craigslist, but he asked to test drive my car. Now, this wasn't a common occurrence, and I hesitated for a moment. But hey, he was a supervisor, and there wasn't any obvious reason to say no. So, I handed him the keys, and off he went, cruising around the block in my clunky, nostalgia-inducing ride. After the test drive, he returned without much fanfare. He didn't end up buying the car, and to be honest, I wasn't surprised. My vintage vehicle had seen its fair share of miles, and it was probably due for the scrapyard. Fast forward almost a decade later, and my old supervisor made headlines. It turns out he was being extradited to the S because he had been found guilty of several murders. The news sent shockwaves through the office grapevine, and I found myself caught in a whirlwind of disbelief. As the details of his crimes emerged, I couldn't help but wonder about that peculiar test drive. Why was he specifically looking for cars with lots of trunk space? Had my old 80s relic somehow been connected to his sinister deeds? The realization sent shivers down my spine, and I began to question the oddities of that seemingly innocuous request. The mind has a curious way of reevaluating past events in light of newfound knowledge. What seemed like a simple test drive at the time now took on a sinister undertone. I couldn't help but play out various scenarios in my head, each one more chilling than the last. Did he have something hidden in the trunk? Or was it just a macabre coincidence that he happened to choose a car with ample storage space for his twisted endeavors? To this day, the mystery lingers in the back of my mind, a bizarre footnote in my life's narrative. It serves as a stark reminder that sometimes the most ordinary moments can hide the darkest secrets and the past has a way of revealing its true colors in the most unexpected and unsettling ways. Alright, so times are tough in Brooklyn, and I recently found myself in need of a quick place to stay. Moved onto a houseboat in December, dealt with enough batch at craziness to last me a lifetime, moved out in February to stay with my girlfriend for a week or two and hunt in the miracle section of Craigslist Price X. Cheap rooms shared hastily, bullshit ranges from 611, but you're in a hurry, don't complain. I find a pretty solid spot a few blocks away. Price is right for a basement in this part of town, so I go to check it out. It's a total farm. You see them occasionally in New York City, walls knocked out and replaced with little cordoned off dorms, one window outside, one plexiglass window and actually NGL, never seen that one, first suspicion four to six rooms to a floor communal bathroom. At least the $13 sandwiches down the street are great. But I digress what struck me was how many laptops my super had. We're in the office, figuring out the rental agreement, and they're everywhere. Stacks, some old, some pretty new. He says the one room just went, but I could have the other new one. I wonder who's leaving cheap housing in the city. Big stacks of laptops, cables for laptops. I go to shower downstairs and remember I left my towel at girlfriend's place. Got the hunch to check the other semi-anomaly and quickly found a towel. But man, the anomaly. An enormous pile of stuff from previous tenants at the other end of the basement. Some new some not so new. At this point I'm giving it all a bit of pause, but I go take my shower and change. Farms have turnover, but that's a lot of stuff, and who leaves clean towels? One of the other housemates comes out of his dorm as I'm leaving mine having showered and changed. Hey man, I just moved in here. Me too. Room was really cheap. I don't even have a laptop. Am I gonna get zip-tied and fed to billionaires? Why are there other people just moving in here on the same day? Why is everyone who's left leaving behind useful shit? Why the hell does my room have a tiny plexiglass window? Why didn't I care three days ago when I needed a place bad? I could charitably be described as a total idiot, but I know my horror movies, and I don't know what to do with this many horror movie warnings. In 2011, it was around August, and I had been searching for a dress for my sister's wedding for weeks. Since I didn't have much money and would wear the dress only once, I decided to check Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Luckily, I found a dress that looked great on me, 
and I loved its style and colors. Excitedly, I contacted the seller on Craigslist and planned to meet her at her house the next day to buy the dress. However, I started to feel unsure about going alone when she gave me her address. The area was not safe, and many bad incidents happened to women there. The neighborhood was in a rundown rural town, and many houses looked empty. As I drove by them, I checked the address again to be sure before driving up to her house, as I didn't want any trouble in this area. The place felt like where you might find those eccentric, intense people. I knocked on the door, and a woman answered. She looked older than I expected and seemed very tired, with big black bags under her eyes. It was a bit unsettling, to say the least. She invited me inside, and I saw the dress hanging on a door handle in the living room. It looked just like the pictures, and I was really happy with how it looked. I felt too nervous to try it on there, so I awkwardly held it up against my body to check the size. While I was paying for the dress, something strange happened. The woman's eyes kept moving around the room, and she seemed anxious, like something bad was going to happen. I wasn't sure if she was on drugs or had a mental disability. Out of nowhere, as I was giving her the money, she suddenly lunged at me with her head, but I somehow managed to dodge it. Then I ran out of the house as fast as I could, and I could hear her chasing after me. I got into my car and quickly locked the doors. She started hitting my windows, trying to get inside. I started the car, hit the gas, and drove away as fast as I could, leaving her behind. She was screaming loudly, like someone who wasn't well in their mind. I didn't look back until I reached home, and I probably drove faster than I should have. My mind couldn't understand what had just happened, and I started crying while driving. My heart was pounding as I left that place behind, and my hands were shaking a lot on the steering wheel. I couldn't believe what had just happened. I kept thinking about it over and over, trying to understand why that woman had tried to hurt me. When I got home, I decided to call the police and tell them everything. The police listened to my story and said they would investigate the area where it happened, but even after two weeks, they didn't give me any updates, and I never found out what happened to the woman or why she did that. I tried to forget about it, but I still felt uneasy and worried. I couldn't stop thinking about the woman's scary eyes and how she had jumped at me. I wondered why she acted that way and what she was hiding. I started having bad dreams about her and that house. In my dreams, she was always chasing me and I couldn't get away. I would wake up feeling sweaty and tired. I knew I had to do something about it. I decided to go back to the house and find out what had happened. I was scared, but I wanted to face my fears. This time I brought my dad and brothers with me. We also took some safety items like mace and a taser in case she tried to attack me again. As we returned to the neighborhood, I realized that the house was gone. All that was left was an empty lot with a few bits of trash still blowing around in the midday breeze. I decided to go next door and ask some of the neighbors if they knew what had happened. It turned out the lady had been sectioned into a mental hospital for biting one of her neighbors who lived further up the lane. He ended up getting infected with a type of mycelium or fungus that apparently this woman had infested in her bloodstream and brain. I guess this all explained her lunges at me, and now I could finally sleep slightly better, knowing that she was locked away getting the help that she needed. Not a horror story as such, but just a really weird situation. I'm in Australia, so this is a Gumtree Ake, our version of Craig's List story. A few months back, I get a phone call from a random older man, who is clearly very, very, very drunk, and he's asking for me by name, full name, and talking about how his mum had bought something off me probably ten years ago. It was creepy because he's telling me about where I live and telling me how I looked then, that he had driven his mum to my place to pick up whatever the heck it was that I had sold. I have absolutely no recollection of it. I didn't hang up because I was so off put by this random person saying this stuff, and it was just so weird. He must have realized that he was creeping me out a bit, and he apologized, and that's when he's explained that his mum had passed away, and he's going through her address book and came across my name and number, and it reminded him of the times he used to take her places. I have bought a lot, sold some, on Gumtree over the years, and have never felt worried about going to someone's home or having someone come here, until this phone call. 
But when he finally put some context into the call, it eased my mind. It was just an older bloke grieving for his mum. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.